What happens when you put two experts behind mics to match wits on the current state of financial services, the economy, investments, and more? From the American College of Financial Services, this is Wealth Managed. Welcome to Wealth Managed. I'm Michael Finca. I'm a professor of wealth management at the American College. And I'm David Blanchett, head of retirement research at PGM. And we're here today with Ross Riskin. Ross Riskin is an associate professor of taxation here at the American College and also an expert in education planning. And this is something I think a lot of parents are thinking about right now. I know that our producer, Chris, has just gone through this process of filling out the FSA and the FAFSA. Ross, a lot of people are not that familiar with how this all works. Why don't you just start at the very beginning? What is a FAFSA? What is an FSA? Why do people fill it out? How should you fill it out? What is the strategy? Are there ways to do it right? Are there ways to do it wrong? What should you as an advisor tell your client about how to get started with education planning? Well, thank you for having me, Michael and David. And I'm also very excited that you pronounced it correctly because the majority of people I encounter actually say FAFSA, they throw an extra S in there, but it is correct FAFSA, right? Free application for federal student aid. And so this is something that really a family needs to fill out in order to qualify for federal aid. And so that could be in the form of student loans, it could be in the form of work study and some other supplemental grants offered by the Department of Education. You know, financial aid filing season starts October 1. So usually you have this period of October 1 through even, even through February or March. That's when the deadlines usually are, but you want to get in as early as possible. That's when you're filling out this form where students and their parents are reporting their income, they're reporting their assets, they're disclosing some other information. So the financial aid formula can basically assess this expected family contribution. They can figure out, well, how much can your family actually afford to pay towards college? And then they go back and each school has its own different aid distribution policies where they say, okay, well, based on you have this much need, this is how much we can offer in the form of assistance. And then further that assistance gets broken down between two categories that you know families and advisors need to be aware of. It's really two different types of aid, self-help aid and gift aid. So gift aid is coming in the form of scholarships and grants and this tax-free money you don't have to repay. And then you have self-help aid, right? Which those are loans, right? That's stuff that's helping you maybe solve the cash flow problem, but it's money you're going to have to ultimately repay with interest down the road. So Ross, who has to complete the FAFSA? Is it just a child and their parents or would other people like grandparents or siblings ever complete the FAFSA? Yeah, great question. So the FAFSA is going to be the student and then what's known as the custodial parent, right? So if you have a situation where both parents are married, both parents are reporting their asset and income information. If you have a situation where there's separation or a divorce, only the custodial parent fills it out. And here's where we start to get into this gray confusion area is, well, who is the custodial parent? Is it what the divorce decree says? Is it who claimed the child as a dependent for income tax purposes? Well, Historically, the FAFSA has defined the custodial parent as the parent with whom the student lived with for the majority of the previous 12 months. So a lot of people don't know that. They think it's, oh, who claimed the child? In a lot of divorce situations, you have parents alternating claiming the child. So it really is that where are they residing? Now that is changing with some new financial aid laws that are going into place as a result of the FAFSA Simplification Act, where now it's going to go to, okay, which parent actually provides the majority of support for the student for the prior, prior year? So a lot of different moving variables here. I, I think what adds even more confusion is that the FAFSA is used to determine the, the federal, it's called the federal methodology, but there's something called the institutional methodology that we have about 400 private institutions that are using they're collecting this data when you fill out a form called the CSS profile. And so that's offered through college boards. That's gonna be the same place your students go when they register for the SAT. Well, that has different requirements. It's still gonna assess income and assets, but it's gonna assess some additional assets that maybe aren't assessed on the FAFSA. And then when it comes to well, which parents fill it out, a lot of schools actually want the non-custodial parents to fill it out as well. So you have this situation where if you have a family where they divorce, both parents divorce and they both remarry, you could have schools actually requesting asset and income information from four different adults and then factoring that into <laughs> the award letter and the aid that the student's going to be eligible to receive from that institution. So I mean, obviously the FAFSA affects student aid. Could it also affect acceptance or admittance into a school? 
No, it, 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 it really doesn't. It's not really factoring into admissions for the school. What I will tell you related to admissions, and it was something that actually came up with a prospective client I talked to, where the family made a ton of money, they had a ton of assets. So they're like, you know, we're not going to fill out the forms. We're not going to qualify for any aid. But the student is the one who's kind of getting the messages from the financial aid office. And they're saying, oh, well, let me go in and I'll fill it out. Let me just report all zeros. And so that's what the student did. They actually went in, they, they reported zero for income, zero for assets, just to get it done and submit it. They're like, I'm not going to qualify for aid. But the school interpreted that as them intentionally lying on that form to try to qualify for aid. And they actually did revoke a mission in that case. So you don't really need to worry about it in the normal sense of things, as long as you're not doing something like that. But there are those funky cases. So don't put zeros, but most clients of financial advisors, they're wealthy, they have high incomes. What is the strategy for filling out a FAFSA? I mean, how is it used? How is it going to affect the amount of money that you're ultimately going to have to pay for a college education? So I think one of the best ways to approach it, or you need to think about it is understand a couple of basic premises. So the first one is to understand that the FAFSA and the financial aid formula is income driven. So you really need, we need to segment out our clients. Like, are we, are we working with someone who is high income and high net worth, or are they maybe high income, low net worth, or they may be low income, high net worth. So we really need to figure that out because a lot of people think that, oh, cause I have a ton of money in the bank or a ton of money in my investment account that I'm not going to qualify for aid, but the formula assesses assets at such a low level and it provides all these different allowances, you know, based on the age of the oldest parent in the household and a couple of different ones there. So we really need to first classify or categorize our clients kind of into those buckets with it. Then the other thing to really keep in mind is even though when you fill out the FAFSA now, it generates this number called the EFC, the expected family contribution that is changing. That is now going to be referred to as the student aid index. Because it's not, it's not really truthful in what it says. So for example, you can have a parent who goes in and they fill that out and the expected family contribution, which is made up of both a student contribution and a parent contribution could say $40,000. So that means if you go and apply to a school that costs $30,000, well, you're not demonstrating any need. So you're not going to be able to qualify for any need-based grants or scholarships like that, but you could qualify for merit-based scholarships based on the merit of the student. And you're always going to be able to qualify for the federal student loans. So the Stafford student loans, the direct loans made to the students, you're just not going to benefit from any interest subsidization on there because you don't qualify. So regardless of the amount of income or assets, the student's always going to be able to qualify for those loans. And at the same time, the parents are going to be able to qualify to borrow what's known as a plus loan. Those are made to parents of undergraduate students or graduate students going to graduate school. So that's something important to keep in mind. Even if you have a family, let's say they're high income, they're high net worth, they maybe want to have those options of borrowing because maybe they have enough money to pay out of school. But from a cash flow planning perspective, from a enhancing financial literacy of their kids, maybe this is the first opportunity for them to actually take on some debt at a manageable level. They need to actually fill out the FAFSA. If you don't fill it out, you're, you're not able to do that. So they have to do that to at least have options for when it comes to developing the funding plan. So Ross, you said that it's mostly based on income, but it's just income for, for a single single year, right? It's, it's maybe what the previous year's tax returns, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's looking at income from actually the prior, prior year. So get ready to get confused with me here. So let's say you have somebody who's filling out the form, or let's say someone filled out the form October of 2021. October of 2021, the student is going to be enrolling, let's say in the fall of 2022. They are actually reporting their income information from 2020. It's two years before they actually enroll in school. So someone who's going to be a freshman in the fall of 2023 is using 2021 information and, and so forth, but you have to fill that out every year. So income looks back two years. The value of assets is as of the date you fill out the form, right? So if I fill in October, 2021, it's what are my assets worth October, 2021, but what was my income for 2020? Well, one thing that seems interesting to me there is that, you know, obviously if you have like a blowout year, two years previous, how is the aid determined though? I mean, is, is the biggest aid determined upon admittance? And so then to some extent, is that 
is that income two years before you apply like the most important year? Obviously, you're gonna you're gonna resend in the FAFSA every every year. But I would think that you know when they're when they're admitting people and figuring out aid packages, like that income just before you apply or is going to be probably the most important. Am I right? Wrong? You are you are you're spot on. So that's what we that's known as kind of the base income assessment year. So you will basically want to have that income as low as possible because you're right. Schools when they're determining their aid distribution. Uh, their packages right over four years, they're, they're, they, they have to use some baseline. So they're going to use whatever you reported that first year. It may adjust up and down as you report in, pre, in following years, but a lot of times it will remain the same. So another way for advisors and families to remember that is really the spring semester of the student's sophomore year in high school. That is the start of that year. So if you have someone there, they're just getting into high school and okay, finish freshman year. Now you have to be on the go because okay, spring semester, that is that first year of income that's going to be assessed and going to help determine that the financial aid packages you're going to receive at those schools. Is that worth planning for? So if you've got a client who owns their own business, who has a lot of agency over deciding how much income they can report that year, is that even a strategy? Is that something people should consider? It absolutely is. And so, you know, a couple of things to bring up there, if you're thinking about a business owner is, yeah, if you can actually not manipulate, but better control the recognition of income. And maybe you defer it in some years, or maybe you accelerate it in years prior. That can be a huge advantage from a, from a planning perspective. The other interesting thing with business owners is historically on the FAFSA, at least, there's a small family-owned business exclusion. So any individuals who own family-owned businesses, so greater than 50% ownership by the family and less than 100 employees, don't have to actually report the value of the business, no net worth of the business. So even if you have 100 grand in the business checking account, if it's valued at whatever, it doesn't matter, it doesn't get reported. So once again, it's only the income that is actually pulling through. I did some analysis on that a couple of years ago especially when Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came out. And a lot of business owners are trying to figure out, well, wait a second, should I be a C corporation? Should I be an S corporation? You know, what's, what's better? Because there's a lot of tax ramifications with the QBI deduction, the flatter rate there. So they're, they're trying to figure that out. But then you also have to think about, well, how does income actually get distributed from those businesses, right? So what, if you're an S corp or you're a partnership, you're a sole proprietor, it's all flowing through to your individual income tax return. And what do we know about financial aid formula in the FAFSA? It's picking up everything that comes through the individual income tax return. If you're a C corporation, well, it's only going to pick up what you're taking as salary on a W-2 and if you have any dividends. But if you're retaining income in the C corporation, that never flows through or you can control whether that flows through or not to the FAFSA. So business owners have some other things they need to think about. But if they have the ability to control the recognition of income strategically, that's one major advantage that you don't get just being a W-2 employee. Now's a good time to take a break. We'll be right back. Deliver financial planning for every person and every need through our chartered financial consultant education program. Find the tools and skills you need at theamericancollege.edu slash chfc. Get best in class preparation for your exam with our CFP certification education program. Start your journey toward this value designation at theamericancollege.edu slash CFP. Welcome back. Let's continue where we left off. What are some examples that you've experienced with clients that have been able to execute a strategy? How much have they actually saved by thinking a little bit about the FAFSA? It depends and it varies, but you could see some families that actually qualify for an additional probably ten to $25,000 per year tax-free scholarship. So that's, that's the other thing to think about it here is it's not just, oh, it's a $10,000 scholarship. No, it's tax-free. So what would you have needed to earn either via wages or through the business to be able to write a check for that $10,000? And so the differences can be rare, but there's a lot that goes into it. So one piece of it is it's kind of the income and the asset planning, right? Of like, where are things located? Where are assets properly located? How is income actually being distributed? Are we deferring it in the correct years? Are we recognizing it earlier on to be aware of those assessment years? But then the other big piece of it is what I like to refer to as strategic school selection. So moving beyond just saying, oh, I, my guidance counselor likes these schools, 
because they're similar and they compete for the same students. It's like, no, you got to do a deeper dive and see, well, what are the aid distribution policies of schools? Because there can be schools that actually look the same. They look like they compete for the same students, but school A over here could maybe meet 100% of need, like a lot of Ivy League universities do. And then you have school B over here that only meets 60% of your need. So you're going to be left with this funding gap. So that's where a lot of it comes into play is kind of managing expectations of clients and their kids to know that, hey, guess what? If you're applying to a school where you're barely going to get into the school, you're not in the top 10 or top 20% in admittance pool, you're probably not going to get wowed by some crazy merit-based scholarship or some other scholarship like that. You're probably going to be paying full price. Whereas if you look maybe a tier below or something where you are highly desirable from the school and they actually do meet a great percentage of need and they meet a greater percentage of the need in the form of a merit-based scholarship, you could qualify for twenty and $30,000 tax-free scholarship. And that, that's the real challenge is because so many parents, and even advisors, they're still hung up on sticker prices. So they're still looking at a school and saying, oh, this private school costs $75,000. I'm not going to apply there. But the reality is when you do the math out for a lot of families, the $75,000 school may cost $35,000 and the state school costs 30. So it's a much narrower gap than is perceived. And a lot of people are turned off by just the sticker price because they don't understand how the aid policies work at those schools. This is Chris, one of the producers of the podcast, and I'm literally in this process with my daughter right now. And it's an interesting point you make because I see the sticker price. And then a lot of platforms out there talk about what it really averages out to be in most cases. Does any of your research show that if those are accurate or not, or is it still just going to come down to the individual? The averages are good as kind of like an initial benchmark. So like there are tools out there like College Aid Pro is a good software that actually knows how to calculate your expected family contribution, knows the aid distribution policies of the schools, but can also incorporate like merit-based scholarships based on GPA, SAT scores, things like that. So you get a more accurate picture there. But there's another tool out there, Tuition Fit. That's a place where people are actually uploading their actual award letters. You can actually see what the school's are actually offering and issuing based on a particular student profile. But a lot of times it's going to be individualized, right? I mean, even if you get into different cases where maybe you have somebody who they have types of talents that just aren't represented by those averages for aid, right? There are some schools that maybe offer a music scholarship. Like I know Holy Cross offers that if you can play this organ and you major a minor in music, well, you can qualify for basically free ride there. Well, that's not picked up really in that average, or maybe you have siblings that are going at the same time, and now you're afforded an additional discount. Well, that's not necessarily picked up in that average there. So it, it's good looking at the average because it at least paints that picture that, oh, we don't have to rely on sticker price, but you should still go through the process to even have the option. That's the tricky part here is I'm at least a believer that you want to have options, right? So you want to actually apply and you want to you want to submit your stuff so you have things to evaluate rather than just assuming you're not going to qualify for aid, assuming it's not going to work out, it's not in your budget. You need to you need to do the planning, but you still also need to apply uh, so you have those options. Thank you. I could keep asking questions like, for instance, my wife was not employed in 2020, the year we were given the snapshot for our applications. And now come next year and so forth, our income is going to be, you know, significantly higher. Are we going to then face major cuts in the support that we might get? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it is possible. I mean, the good news is you're reporting the lowest income possible in the base income assessment year, and you're doing everything by the book. That's correct. So that's fine. Whether the school is adjust or not, that's something worth having a conversation with the financial aid office to ask them, hey, you know, what is the likelihood of this aid actually remaining stable? A lot of them have bans, which that, hey, as long as the income doesn't move like a significant amount or there's some other weird fluctuation like that, that they can't project out, that there could be significant changes. But, but here's the other thing to remember. College is a business. A lot of people don't realize that or, or for, kind of forget that and think, oh, I'm honored to have been accepted. And while that's true, they're business trying to fill seats. So that means the first award letter you receive is usually not the last. You can always have flexibility, especially in today's environment, to negotiate, to go back and say, you know what? That doesn't work for my family. Like my parents have two other kids that we have to send to school. I can't afford to do this and see what they actually come back to. Now, every school is a different process for that. You need to follow it. But the first award letter is not the last. And families really should be aware of that. And advisors should be helping recognize that as well, because the other issue parents are faced with is there is no standardization or uniformity when it comes to financial aid award letters. 
So they all look different. I mean, I was looking at, I, I forgot what the number was, but it was something crazy. Like there was like over a hundred ways in which a direct Stafford loan was written. Like it was written literally in a hundred different ways, like formatted wording wise and award letters that they sampled. So you have this level of confusion where maybe it actually doesn't have the word loan in there. So parents think it's a scholarship or a grant they don't have to repay. So that's been the case even with parent loans and the parent borrowing situation. So advisors really can play a huge role in not only helping make sure we're incorporating strategies to be aware of when is income being reported, where assets located, what's the valuation of them when reporting them on the forms, make sure we're not reporting any more than we need to, right? So still one of the biggest mistakes people make is a lot of people still report retirement assets, which retirement accounts are not assessed in the formula. So you have that going on, but they can also play a role in the back end of when the students actually receive award letters and families are going through evaluating, hey, what are my options? What's the real cost I'd be paying here? And what are the best ways to actually fund the gap even for families that have enough saved. I mean, that's that's another consideration. If you're working with somebody who's higher income or higher net worth, let's say they're high net worth and they have enough saved to pay, should they be paying all of it out of there? Or what if they have 529 plans and taxable investment accounts? What's the right strategy to distribute money out of those accounts? So it's kind of like a it's kind of like a preview for retirement planning, right? You're kind of like you're saving for a goal and then you have a distribution period, but they're both kind of compressed. So there's different considerations to think about. Ross, this has been great. You know, I've got four small children, not quite college age yet, but hopefully I can I can reflect back on the episode today when they get closer to applying to college. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me, guys. Be sure to check out another podcast from the college called Next Gen in 10, where we cover some other exciting topics related to next gen advisors. And thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Michael Finca. And I'm David Blanchett. See y'all later. For more episodes and shows, visit theamericancollege.edu slash podcasts. Wealth Managed is a production of the American College of Financial Services. 